Howdy, everybody. I'm excited to have the first guest for the Public Goods Podcast. If you guys don't know what the Public Goods Podcast is, it's a podcast featuring people who are building new funding mechanisms for public goods and also building public goods. And we have a change maker in this space, someone who's influenced the trajectory of my travels in uh, the past six months that I had the privilege to meet in uh, Funding the Commons and who is not only building public goods funding mechanisms, but really deep and involved into the coordination of people and network states and going to where impact is needed most. Uh, so I'm really excited to have Noah Lee as the first guest on. How you doing, Noah? I'm doing great. It's great to see you, Plug. And yeah, I'm glad we're able to stay connected, keep talking after we've met in different places around the world. It's been an encouraging transition in my life to meet more and more tech people interested in public goods. And I feel like there's this global community of people to reach out to care about this. Yeah, and there's so much uh, to talk about in terms of your, your journey, not only just connecting people about what you're building, uh, but I, I wanted to get a kind of little intro about how you got into the space. Normally people talk about Web3, but I'm really interested in how did you start kind of looking into the intersection of impact and tech or public goods or whatever you kind of green pilled you into the space? Yeah, well, long story short is I was searching for a meaning in life. I was questioning what religion to believe in. I was visiting lots of different countries, lots of different religious centers from the age of 17 traveling around the world. And what made me feel like I had a sense of meaning in life was finding community in Ecuador. I was backpacking through there. I was teaching juggling and some circus stuff for kids at an orphanage there. And they just would welcome people in, make it feel like home, make it feel like family and the community. And I feel like that had been what was missing. Uh, so but the first tech project was pretty uh, not not the most high tech. Like, we, we just crowdfunded and bought some solar lights that are in power banks. So it's like a phone sized portable charger that has a light in it. And we brought it out to the Amazon jungle and delivered it to some people who are relatives of my, pretty much like my adopted brother, Francisco, who he grew up without a family. Then he went to this orphanage where I met him, where he became a caretaker, helped take care of other people to give them the sort of opportunities that people helped him out with as a kid. And so we visited his relatives, uh, saw how much of a difference we could make just by bringing these solar lights and like the, the kids would use them, the people would use them to, they would read to their kids. And that was my first project. And then I went to try and figure out how do we do more things that can scale up and help a lot of people with tech and maybe even do that in a way that makes us more connected to our communities. And then I remember some time, like you actually kind of told a story about like a crowdfunding campaign or something that went wrong and that really kind of reinforced your uh, ideals to why Web3 is important. Can you touch a little bit on that? Yeah, so especially all, all across Latin America, this happens frequently where people will try and crowd, for example, buy a farm together. Like there's people who would try to buy a farm together during the pandemic where a lot of people lost their jobs. And then because, you know, it's difficult to set up the legal side, like, or to set up a bank account and then make the foundation. And then like, it, that's a lot of difficulty. So in the end, this group just gave all the money over to a, one person uh, who took the money and, and ran away with it. And that lost some life savings. They were supposed to have a farm which would feed the neighborhood. So we see how, the, how these things can go wrong, right? And we're trying to make better systems or one, you don't even need to set up a bank account. We can have a simple way to transfer money all around the world and have shared governance and build in ways that you can do things. For example, where you have multiple keys, a multi-sig, so that way you can have more safety of like, you can't just have one person has all the control over it and give options that are simple and accessible for people to use and really have the benefits for the people who need it. And so we've got like a range of different things, crowdfunding for, for tech projects to supporting kids shelters and beyond. Yeah. Can you kind of speak on like, like, I don't know if that directly or like what the kind of time period is of you traveling around, uh, you know, really uh, 
uh, in that nomadic lifestyle to like getting into tech, tech and then like when Via Prize came along. So you can, can you speak on a little bit of kind of your evolution into the tech scene and then how, um, yeah, how like the origins of Via Prize? Yeah. So pretty much I went to UC Berkeley, not because I necessarily cared about taking the classes, that was fun. I just figured that would be a good place to get involved with the tech scene. And so uh, I was training with the military, gave me a scholarship training with the Marine Corps, but then I dropped out after one year because I, uh, well, there was a lot of difficult things. One, I dropped out in part because it was too expensive to pay for rent and support my adopted family in Ecuador at the same time. So that was a really tough time period where I had nothing but just a backpack full of clothes and a desperate need for entrepreneurship. So just like unemployed freshman dropout, can't afford rent and support my loved ones. So that was a rough time. Uh, just like crashing on friends' couches, trying to make something work, but kept looking around, found a great AI job uh, just by talking with people. And as soon as I got a job opportunity, uh, they basically said like, help us build our team of our, our new. Hey. Yeah, you cut, you cut off at uh, the AI job. Oh, yeah, I got booted. That was weird. I mean, the connection seems great now. All right, should I continue from there? Yeah, yeah, from like like when you uh, when you kind of got the AI job, you were, you're talking about sleeping on the friends' couches. Yeah. Yeah, so then I found this AI startup, and the founders were asking me, hey, can you help us build up the team? And I built a team of 70 people and was making six figures as a freshman dropout, was able to take care of my loved ones. Uh, but then I noticed that the automations we were building allowed some groups to be able to fire people uh, because we were automating away jobs. And I'm not that thrilled that that was kind of a metric of success, which is basically like centralizing wealth to us in a way. Um, yeah, so then I decided to keep traveling and look around, uh, found this community called Zuzalu, where it was a two month gathering of tech entrepreneurs in Montenegro and Europe. And at that point, I already was talking about crowdfunded prizes as an idea of various people and seeing that people weren't actually trying it. So I was telling various people, let's have bounties, which are open invitations for anyone to build a project. So it's more decentralized. It's basically a way to outsource like, hey, I've got this great idea. I don't have time to do it. Could someone build this? And what if more people could say that is a good idea, add into the funding for it so you can see the demand for the idea grow and then just have an open invitation for anyone to make it. Uh, so people thought this was a good idea, but weren't building it. So I just decided, all right, I'll do it myself. And we started testing it out there while we were together with that group of tech entrepreneurs in Montenegro. Now that's, that's kind of incredible um so i was never at zuzalu and i think a lot of people they hear about zuzalu but how did it happen how did you get invited like what were what were the themes uh can you kind of go into into like the zuzalu folklore for for all that's uh going there and and is it is it something that continues like like what's a zuzalu okay yeah so I mean, Vitalik Buterin, founder of Ethereum and a couple others, they talked together about this idea. Let's gather together. Let's do something longer than a conference where people can really connect with one another, where we can co-live and build things together. And it came together really fast with a, with a couple months of planning. It's kind of this miracle fast thing. And the invitation you receive is nothing but like a short flyer, which has a picture. And it's like, build with tech people. Come here. And not much information. <laughs> Uh, so it was already a filter for people who are just kind of like, yes, people who are willing to do crazy things. And uh, we show up and it's got different theme weeks. So one week would be about AI. The next week would be about longevity and biotech. The next week would be about Web3. The next week, public goods. Another week about network states and coordination. So we had all these different topics. And it was kind of like a conference every weekend where guests would come in. And the way it functioned is basically you had the initial organizers each invited uh, residents. So each of like uh, maybe 10 ish initial organizers invited 15 residents. And then each residence could invite two guests. And then we'd also invite some speakers in. So some guests would stop in for like a week or for that weekend for the conference days. And then we'd have maybe a couple hundred residents who stayed there for a couple months and you would really get to know better. 
And so, like, from what I've been hearing from people who've in the Zuzalo scene or who's, like, been coming from it, it's like, like you said, like, really the start of some ideas. Some people had the most impactful time and the best experience of their life there. What do you think is kind of in uh, the secret, you know, Powerpuff girl's recipe? Like, what's, what's cooking up in Zuzalo that really makes it an, an organic experience outside of just a, a conference? Like, <laughs> Yeah, I think the main thing is that people have such a need for community. And it's this big question of like, how do we scale up society while still feeling connected to your own small group where people really are spending time together, having fun activities together, sharing in, in life. And in this case, since there's a lot of new people all come together, then everyone's looking to get to know one another, make these new friends. So I spent a lot of time in hostels, like backpacker hostels. And it's kind of that vibe where everyone's there because they're kind of exploring. They're here to meet people. Let's go out and get dinner together. And there was a lot of planning that went into this. It was great. Like uh, a free breakfast was provided to everyone every morning. So you would meet people there, eat breakfast before doing work. And then we do a lot of activities together. So for example, I was organizing acro yoga. I organized like some juggling and some jujitsu and activities like that because we wanted to live healthy lifestyles. And my personal vision of how this could continue, because uh, you know it took a lot of funding to put this together. How can we make this easier and easier for people to do? So it's not like a news article about some wild event. It becomes something where it's like, here's a guide that you can make this happen with your own friends. So there's been more pop-up cities. Like we were together in Thailand where things were like way cheaper and it would be like $5 a night. You could stay in like a dorm shared with other people. And that was an awesome experience similar where we called it a pop-up city. And I mean, you, you can know a lot about that already where we went on hikes together. Uh, we did a lot of building together in the co-working space. And it felt like that community was really tight knit. And maybe there's something magical in there being an end date where you know we're just together for these couple months, but also maybe we can expand it. Maybe this will become more and more permanent communities where people join together too. So how would you kind of delineate a pop-up city, what's happening in Zuzalu, Mu Chiang Mai? I know you're in Vitalia, a biohacking kind of centric event. How would you describe that and between what Balaji is talking about in network states? And like, where do you see... This, it, like, is Zuzalu a network state or like, how does that interplay? Mm, yeah. So that was an interesting discussion where when I was helping organize a hackathon in Singapore, Balaji would, was there and we talked about how it might not be a network state so much trying to become this new government, new country, but it's more like a network school. We want people to come together and learn together and maybe have kind of an incubator for projects to grow, especially open source projects where we're not trying to hide things in secret about how we build. Instead, anyone can fork our code, they can use our projects. So like the project I'm making via prize is all open source, allowing people to crowdfund and do prizes. And network state, I think it matches some of the ideals, but I also think we're we're more interested in building tech than we are about building new governments, I'm pretty sure, for most of the people at Zuzalu. But it was also meant to be an intersection of a lot of different interests, right? Which is why there was a week on network states, but there's also a week on coordinations where network state, they said, this is more about exiting and making something new. Whereas coordinations, they focused more on how do we build up civil societies within the existing structures and certainly there was both perspectives present. And so uh, kind of going off of that, like there's also a very meta element to it because I think one of the things about like a network state is that a lot of the infrastructure of tech is actually being built to facilitate the network state. And I saw this a lot in Istanbul and heard kind of the precursors to this. Um, and then you were kind of building a platform that you use and even in Chiang Mai, like you had like a, a ZK voting platform to decide how to delegate the bounties. They had Zoo Pass, like a, an identity solution. So is mm -hmm. is it like a real like meta type of thing where people come together and they try to build the tools around a coordination and network state in a pop-up city? Or like what is, what's kind of uh, 
Can you kind of like talk about that environment of like the the, the actually hacking uh, the, the environment together? Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of simplify, because I got so many things in my life, it kind of comes down to I'm building Via Prize, which is to empower communities so that they can more easily come together, crowdfund things, take care of one another, which then also could be used as network state tooling. And that's kind of the other side of my life is pretty much supporting pop-up cities and how we can cross coordinate between these different pop up cities and communities. And so one is a tool for the other. And certainly it can scale up to be something really big. For example, in the definition of a network state, it mentions crowdfunding, buying land together. And there isn't really a go-to platform for that. And that's something that we can provide. But it's not really quite at a level, I would say, where people are making new countries. It's more like people are making new special economic zones at the moment with some separate corporate legislation. And most importantly, like the end goal is that we are living in communities that align with our values, where we have choice to go with people who we want to share life with, and that everyone should have that sense of community. So I think basically, for me personally, it's about making tools that can scale up and be bigger, but still stay focused on making sure this makes people more connected. And I would say that a lot of people are trying to do similar things and we can make both true in the spectrum of like, hey, do we stay small and stay with our friends or do we go big and try and benefit a lot of people if we just make lots of small communities that cross coordinate? And that's a vision I wanna see and I think there can be tools which everyone uses that connects these many communities while on the social layer, not the tech layer, each group stays kind of like, hey, this is our area, these are our people, and then you can have representatives and bridges. So can you like kind of speak on these societies and how they popped up? Because even in Chiang Mai, like I didn't even know where Chiang Mai was. Uh, even after you told me where it was and I came in like a week later, we zoomed out on the map and we're like, oh, this is this is where we're at. Um, and so okay. the kind of idea of like popping up and especially in, in, in Web3, where we're a very nomadic culture and we want to explore the world and we want to go uh, like where the impact is at. I think there's a lot of opportunity to like find your tribe and and start them as uh, they go along. So kind of mentioned like Duzalu popping up, Mu Chang Mai, Vitalia. But you've been going to like a lot of places where even the most uh, bravest of nomads would not venture. So can you kind of tell uh, us about your journeys like in between and kind of the, the cultures and the societies you met? I know you went to like Ukraine and Syria and which are, I think, active conflict zones. I don't even necessarily know. So can you kind of explain your experience there and what what like draws you to, to go into these places? and? what you're trying to learn or achieve. Yeah. And this is a personal struggle of mine because it did kind of feel like there were two separate areas of my life. The one side is like that community in Ecuador and I'm really inspired by people working for indigenous rights and it felt so different people who, yeah, I'm inspired by and then people in the tech world. And it's been a process of kind of bringing those together. And so immediately after Zuzalo, for example, where it was like really fancy, like I think the World Economic Forum used the same space as us immediately as we were ending, just funny things like that. And right after that, I went to Ukraine and uh, as I was driving in, for example, a family hosted me and we would we were huddled together as there were bombings and like something hit close enough that the door was shaking and it was it was a mom and dad and their two-year-old son. We just kind of like huddled together in the bathroom at night. Um, and their two-year-old son, I remember the one thing that was like a moment where I really was thinking about how much this is going to affect him for the rest of his life is he would play with his carrots and he would lift them up and he'd go, Weesh! and he'd drop them and he'd go, and he would go, boom, boom. And he would do that when we were eating together and his parents told me that he had started doing that even before he had learned how to speak and he just like grown up with this. Um, and then, so we, we continued onwards. I was in contact with some volunteer medics and we crowdfunded a prize uh, to 
deliver medical supply. Eventually made it, delivered it to the medics. Really inspiring, crazy people and very funny. Uh, I remember when I when I made the delivery, there was one moment where uh, v- Victoria, the person I was delivering it to, is a volunteer medic who left her job at like a bank in San Francisco to go to Ukraine and volunteer and help out, which is just really amazing. And we were driving in this this van and she pointed to a hill and she said, see that? That's where the Russians are and they're going to see us. So put on your helmet. And and then she just like floored it and drove to the next part of the street. And she turned up the radio and it was blasting uh, highway to hell. Just like really crazy people. Uh, and later they messaged me some some uh, pretty, pretty rough pictures that I uh, can't really be sharing on social media, I don't think. But uh, treating injuries that they use the supplies that they had run out of. And they told me like, without a doubt, this saved lives with this delivery. And that was when I decided like, yep, I'm going to do via prize full time and really pursue this. Um, yeah. And then, then it would felt kind of like we were bridging these worlds, like the places where I find inspiration and meet people who are in very difficult situations and people in the tech world who are building and want to have impact. It's, isolated and been very difficult for some years of my life. And now talking with you, for instance, I'm really encouraged. I do feel like we can make this bridge and make sure that what we're building really makes a difference. One of the things when building a product and which is very extremely difficult, especially when you're organizing events and coordinating people and also building a product as well. So uh, shout out to you. Uh, but one thing I really admire is you actually going to the communities and the initial users that um, are that you want to impact. And so what are kind of some product insights you learned about building via prize, uh, using it in practice in these um, very kind of uh, uh, high uh, danger zones or, or communities that need it the most? Like wh- what are what are kind of like the product takeaways if you were to make a uh, show us a little bit about your inspired backlog. Yeah. So for example, the MVP I, I put together, it's just like this white label service that I paid a subscription, which is for normal crowdfunding, which just kind of repurposed it. And it's just web two and you just pay with your credit card. And if people wanted to donate with web three, I just literally would type in the description. Here's the address to send crypto to, and I would manually update the front end to show how much had been donated. So that was the MVP to start with. And if that was really making it most helpful, we just stick with that, right? Now we've transitioned into a more Web3 native version where you can log in with your wallet, but only because we are figuring out how to integrate with account abstraction option. So to log in, you can literally type in your email and then you get a code and that's it. Your profile's made, you, you typed in a username and a wallet was made for you but it it was super easy to log into. Uh, So that's really important. It's like keeping in mind, like I want Francisco to be able to contribute and I want him to be able to receive. And so like right now, I actually have a friend who wants to donate a thousand dollars. I'm so grateful to her uh, to support Francisco. And it's also a tough time because like we're trying to start this community center and a, a single mom who was in a domestic abuse situation with like a guy she was staying with just showed up at Francisco's door because, you know, he's kind of, been helping out for a while. Um, but it's been really tough since the pandemic to kind of get back on our feet with a lot of people losing jobs. So we're trying to kind of restart this, this community and we were forced into it very recently last week, a few days ago, actually, where she showed up with her kids and we're like, okay, well, we got to do this right now, I guess. And how do I send in crypto in a way that's accessible? Like, I don't want to be building things only for for people who can come to events like this. I want to be able to make things that are accessible, that people who really need it can be using. So I guess the specific thing is like, shout out to Privy for that account abstraction option, making it easy to log into your wallet. Yeah, and for those who don't know, Privy is like one of the login solutions used at uh, Friends Tech. Uh, So it has a kind of a battle-tested way of onboarding a a lot of people. And that's something that I found too, building a very like Web3 native product is There is like the whole account abstraction element of things of getting a native wallet, the on ramps as well, and uh, and the meta transactions of paying gas to to really build that experience uh, experience. And I haven't really even seen it done uh, very well in the in the public space, except for um, Mm -hmm. endowment. 
Um, and I, I, th I think, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot we have to learn, um, especially um, with web apps and even building native mobile apps um, and the things about internet connectivity that a lot of us are still uh, figuring out. So I'm, I'm really excited to see kind of how uh, the product evolves. Do you have a little bit insight of your kind of product roadmap? Because you mentioned it's not, you're not just envisioning, you know, crowdfunding um, and uh, an account abstraction. Like what is the ultimate kind of end goal of, of Via Prize? Yeah, great question. And for another specific thing before mentioning that, also we're going to try and switch to USDC instead of donations on ETH. So that way to Web2 users, it just kind of looks like normal dollars. And then we're going to make a gasless transactions and we're making the on-ramp so you can only purchase USDC on optimism with low fees. Uh, so that way it looks really simple to the users like, Hey, there's one currency it's, and there's one thing I can buy to like add funds to my wallet to contribute. That's one more specific thing, which I feel like could work well with things you're building and super happy to jam on ideas, like let the ideas flow, let things be open source. And for the long-term vision now to answer that question. What we want is something I would call a community mutual fund. So for an individual to have exponential growth in their wealth and to feel more secure, you can invest in an index fund. For an entire country, they can invest in a sovereign wealth fund. So for example, like Venezuela didn't do that with its oil wealth, economy collapsed. Norway did do that with its wealth and now it has over a trillion dollars in it and a huge safety net for so many of its citizens who can feel more secure. But in between individual and society, we can feel disconnected because that middle layer, that bridge is community. And we don't really have community mutual funds where you can just have a group of friends all toss in money to invest together. And the vision for that would be split into more or less four segments is the long-term idea. One would be pretty much like a VC arm, which would be investing in more high risk things. It could be even your own community member. Maybe he's selling t-shirts or something. And then the next segment would be established investments. Like it could just be investing in index funds and things which are more secure and more established. The next segment would be emergency savings slash insurance. If you're doing this in the USA, you can do a 501c15, which is a mutual insurance corporation, which means instead of paying an insurance company every month, you can be your own insurance company with funds that you are investing and making money on. And then people would submit like, hey, I broke my leg. Please, can you help me cover this? And then you could vote yes. And then it would be added to like the precedents showing here's the things that we do cover. And then if it's in the gray zone and if it's something new, then you can vote on it, right? And the last segment I would think would be a universal basic income portion where you take some percentage of the interest that's accumulating and distribute it to members. And there should be an easy app that anyone around the world should be able to use. And for voting on how to like support community members and things like that, crowdfunded prizes would be one mechanism in this overall vision that we want to build towards. Now that's incredible. Um, I, I love especially kind of leveraging existing legal wrappers and then building uh, mechanisms that actually make it cheaper uh, to, to enter. Um, I think one, that's actually what got a lot of me and my friends started on Ethereum, the idea of a decentralized hedge fund um, shout out mm. to Enzyme and, and being able to start essentially a, a, a hedge fund for cheaper, even though it, it was ETH mainnet, it was still cheaper than starting a traditional hedge fund. Um, mm -hmm. This is something I saved a lot of money on uh, endowment, which does donor advised funds. Um, and, uh, and like they, yeah, there, there's, there's just a lot of opportunity to actually present these vehicles in a, in a much, uh, in a much cheaper way, a more transparent way and, uh, and really allow for this coordination. But that is like no easy task. There's a lot of primitives to build, like even just with the initial MVP, you're, you're touching gasless transactions, account abstraction, um, and, uh, and tools that weren't even available. Um, and even like base wasn't even available a, a year ago. So like, what are the primitives and the hard issues you're probably going to tackle leading up to, to building this overall vision, uh, that, um, cause I see kind of Sybil with UBI, I see maybe ZK for voting. So like, what are, what are kind of the, the, the big challenges in, in achieving this? Okay. Getting in a little bit of the nerdy side, when you mentioned civil attacks, it was a big challenge. And I, I talked with Vitalik and others as we were trying to figure out, uh, let's say we have a prize and there's multiple people who submit, here's work I did. How do you choose who wins? 
Uh, we considered a lot of different things. We considered quadratic voting and beyond. In the end, what we went for is directly proportional. So let's say you have two people each put in $50 into the prize pool. That means they will each have 50% of the voting power. So more simple to the user to understand as well. Then on top of that, that actually eliminates Sybil attacks. Because let's say one of the people who put in the money, who has 50% of the voting power, also makes a submission with a different account to try and get more of the money. But if only he votes for himself and the votes are hidden until the end, where then it reveals like how everyone voted and how the money is distributed, then he would only literally be getting back his own money that he put in, right? So it eliminates civil attacks in that way. And then we've got some more nerdy details on how to go into that. But yeah, governance side is a big thing that we're trying to figure out all the time. Uh, then to balance out, for example, the builder's security, knowing this much money is waiting for me, which, for example, like Optimism Retro PGF doesn't do that. You're pretty much like just crossing your fingers, like, I hope I get money in some amount, right? So there's no security there for the builder. And then funder confidence, for example, like Gitcoin grants and grants in general, don't give you any confidence that, that you gave them money and now you're actually going to get back something that they built that was worthwhile. So in the middle with crowdfunded prizes, the builder should know how much money is waiting for them if they succeed. And the funder should know the money only goes to them if they succeed. So there's also this matter where, for example, we say that the funders, they can vote and say, we want to get refunded because none of these submissions actually built what is described in the prize. Then, this is one thing we're still figuring out, but this is the plan. Admins, well, this is already in the smart contract. Admins can remove the option to vote on refund. If the admins think, yes, at least one of these submissions deserves to win. So then admins are kind of the one thing that's not so decentralized right now that can step in and protect the builders from funders who maybe just like say, we want our money back, uh, but the builder was expecting to get that funding. And that's the current governance structure for prizes, for example. And there's a lot more that we can dive into, uh, but that's a big area. Other big area, if people want to reach out with advice for gasless funding, best on ramps, we're happy to chat about those things. Yeah, and, and you kind of also uh, starting to pick the threads on, on what you mentioned. So yeah, so with proportional voting, it's, it's harder to Sybil. You kind of see that as a big vector of attack for especially quadratic funding where there's a matched amount and there's kind of people uh, voting with their dollars essentially like like I'm building a lot of actually all of these primitives all these different Legos um, and with, with quadratic funding coming out and one of the big challenges we had is we had to actually start building a, a civil aggregator um, in ourselves which is like another thing mm -hmm. as well and then when you have wow. contracts and you have kind of holding money and you have uh, the idea of escrows um, outside of that, there's so much, it's, it's pretty capital intensive to get audits. Um, but then also on the, on the like legal side, there's like the ideas of like being a virtual asset, a service provider and, uh, processing payments and whether your contracts are locked and having kind of entities to resemble that. So that's one of the, I, I, one of the challenges outside of like actually, you know, coordinating people getting people to develop, but then there is the financial element of things of getting like the audits and then getting the wrappers on there and then actually proving that you were impactful. Um, and, and, and this is a season of green pill right now where uh, impact and tracking is uh, the major motif. And so that's something also that a primitive we've also had to build um, in our ecosystem is like, how do we, um, how do we uh, attest that something was impactful and uh, continue to track it, who attests, how do we kind of do the privileges um, or like what are types of attestations, are there different attestations for different types of projects? And so how, how are you beginning to like think of, uh, of challenging uh, or like tackling the impact problem? Great point. Yeah, impact certificates are in that vision as well, where you add in funding, you get back impact certificate. And that's not built into it yet. We'd love to integrate what other people are building and collaborate on that. And the thought process we were thinking is 45% uh, of the impact certificate would go to the funders distributed proportionally, however they did that. Then 45% would go to the builders who won distributed again. Like if you got 30% of the votes, you get 
that, that 30% of that 45%, you know, you, and there's not really like a first, second, third place so much. It's just like, if you got 20% of the votes, you get 10 and 20% of the funds from the builder perspective, right? And then 5% of the impact certificate would go to the platform and 5% of the impact certificate would go to the person who posted the idea and they would also get 5% of the prize reward. And these are definitely things we need to think through more of like these impact certificates, how do you then analyze if they were actually impactful for the long-term future of this project, if maybe someone builds it, wins a prize and it becomes an entire company, things like that. And we definitely want to be able to think through that more. And my personal idea of this is it won't be like linked so directly. It'll be more like the stock market where stocks are evaluated by other third parties and that helps inform people's decision of pricing it and its long-term potential, right? And I think that's kind of what will happen with impact certificates where it's not like it's built into the impact certificate, how much impact it is so much, but it's like third parties are helping analyze it that you can learn from. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of primitives already in uh, the EVM ecosystem that make it really kind of uh, e easier to do. So, so you, you mentioned like certificates, there's, there's, well, Ethereum attestation service, which is like a, basically you can attest to anything um, and then have resolvers that like execute uh, custom logic on top of it. And then there's also hypercerts that begin to tokenize this as well, that, that there's been a lot of talks about how do we actually turn this into um, like an impact credit, like they normally do in, uh, with like carbon credits and put this on the market. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of exciting things, um, especially with like optimism building on EAS uh, with um, like Karma HQ is an example, Gitcoin, they just implemented, um, uh, you know, an EAS built uh, way of reporting milestones for projects as well. So yeah, I'm really excited to see what comes about in the uh, in the attestation space. And uh, yeah, and really, really kind of excited to see how, you know, crowdfunding bounties relates to uh, to those kind of impact credits. So pretty, uh, pretty exciting stuff. And we're just at the beginning of it. Yeah. So like, one thing I wanted to like, sorry. Yeah, and then I was going to say for yeah, impact certificates to kind of bootstrap their value, we would attach reputation points to it into the platform. And of course, you could like use these impact certificates in other platforms as well that maybe decide to value them with reputation points so it can be cross-platform. And then we're also thinking maybe we'll have raffles where like the more points you have from these impact certificates you have from winning prizes and supporting them, then you also get entered into raffles to win things like an experience of traveling, visiting this island for Vitalia or things like that. Yeah. Even, and even that as itself, I think reputation uh, is like even that in itself, people are even saying we're going to use EAS for that. And attestations are examples of reputations as well. Some people are even looking at uh, like points as maybe uh, a new way of spinning fungible tokens and implementing meta transactions to kind of have this loyalty reward system. So there's a couple of different camps of how that will emerge in practice. Uh, but I, I definitely, and, and I put out an article kind of recently, and one thing that I really want to see in 2024 is building applications that touch everyday people's lives and make it may actually bring daily active users. Because one of the things, and I see a lot of potential for Via Prize that uh, we don't really have with, uh, for example, an endowment. I like donate before the taxes are in, like the, the taxes are due or in Gitcoin, I donate every season, but we're not like using like uh, using these applications every day. So beginning to gamify this with points, with native mobile applications, uh, with different types of attestation so people can actually interact with the application without having to always give money, I think is going to be one of those um, those things in 2024 that really uh, push us over uh, the edge and, and really kind of bolster the community um, there. And, and then one thing that I, I also think that I like really liked that I, I saw you do in Chiang Mai was like that ZK voting experience where you had QR codes and everyone could vote with that. That was very smooth. Like, and it, it was as smooth as like voting on Twitter. Uh, so I, I, I really, uh, I really like that as well, but just uh, putting that uh, out there. Yeah. But like, I don't want to get too much into yeah, I don't want to get too much into the technicals because we can go on forever because there's something beautiful about like the social element that's going on. Um, and I really wanted to speak on uh, like what's going on at Vitalia. And so present day, I think, started a few days ago. Um, and this kind of goes off of network states. And it's pretty interesting because like 
I, all I know about Vitalia, it's a biohacking pop-up city, but it's in this special district of Honduras that I feel like is the precursor to a network state. And so mm. can you kind of explain of like how this came about? Um, what's the kickoff like so far and a little bit about what you're planning at the event? Absolutely. So it's been fascinating how Zuzalu was an inspiration that spawned off a lot of groups. So each of those topic weeks that were in within Zuzalu is starting to become its own entire two-month pop-up city and community. So for example, Mu Chiang Mai in Thailand kind of was the branch off of the ZK week we had during Zuzalu. And then, for example, the longevity and biotech week we had at Zuzalu. Now a lot of people have kind of spun off and done Vitalia. And it is a mix of things. For example, I'm hosting the week, which is most focused on network states. We're calling it the Startup Societies in Crypto Cities Summit. Uh, so I'll be hosting that. Vitalik will be a speaker. Robin Hansen will be a speaker, et cetera. And there's also a week on AI. And there's like two weeks on biotech. So it's like it's more focused on that with still some mix. And then for Prospera, which is this kind of futuristic city here with a special economic zone on the island of Roatan in the Caribbean by Honduras, it's fascinating that a lot of people I think would rightly consider it one of the most advanced network state projects because it has a special economic zone with full sovereignty over corporate law. And what it could become in the future is a marketplace for governments. Because you can incorporate here and then you could buy land and then you could say to enter into this land, you have to opt in for the laws here. And maybe like that community, that lifestyle, maybe also like all that. And so then all these places can be around each other and you can vote with your feet and move to the one that you like best. And they could even shift borders. So unlike traditional nation states that are static with borders, it can shift depending on the demand and the best ones can improve. And it also thinks of government as a service where you want to join this and you pay into it and you can opt in and opt out. You're not forced to be in a monopoly of I'm born in this country and this citizenship. And if it's bad governance, I'm just screwed, right? They want to be able to make that adapt, which is supposed to help Honduras a lot. For example, like the mayor is Honduran and he's a friend and a lot of Hondurans, it's like a mix of Hondurans and mostly Americans, I would say. And the idea is like, imagine if every country had like a smaller version or like a community where it tests out its policies first instead of just arguing in politics to say we think this is going to work actually try it out try it out on a small scale in a kind of a startup society and be to governments what startups are to big corporations and adapt and learn from that to be able to benefit everyone and the government for the entire country could say like wait a second we see this one particular thing they tested out and it worked really well and we have evidence and we have data now we're going to do it for our entire population. And that's a vision here in Prospera. And as well as that, like it's beautiful and uh, they deliver food to you like by drone and things like that. It's becoming this high tech hub that is uh, growing up now. And Vitaly is the, I think the biggest event that's been hosted here. I might be wrong about that, but with these hundreds of people coming in for this event, it's really kickstarting a lot of life and energy here. Yeah, and, and and like you had the privilege of going to uh, the network states like conference uh, before Breakpoint, and and I, I really love what Balaji is doing. Not only because a lot of times in this Web three bubble, we get kind of stuck in our Ethereum space, our public goods. I mean, what I love about the public goods space is like it's like a parlay for different chains mm -hmm. and all the maximalism, and people genuinely want to help. But then outside of that, the network state space is actually like bringing into people who are building currencies and economic zones, people who are building communities and nonprofits. And, and I love how, um, like, to me, this is a, a kind of a precursor of what's going on or what happened with the growth of Singapore and Dubai and all these kind of special economic zones as well. And, and actually having the, the Web3 intersection of that and allowing to, uh, to, to essentially uh, build this in an open way is absolutely incredible and and it's it's, it's great to see that uh what's being built in rotan but like kind of going off of like vitalia and what's out there um can you kind of talk about the emergence of like a little bit about the d side space and the biohacking space and like what's the what's the longevity vibe like do you feel like you're about to live longer from the few days you were there 
<laughs> well, I, I certainly like going out in the sunrise meditation out by the beach that they've been doing. I love that. Uh, doing cold plunges and such. Breakfast is nice. And yeah, a lot of people are trying to be healthy. And one of the things I've noticed, for example, I've had a couple conversations where we're saying like, oh man, there's so much work I should do. And we tell them like, hey, take care of yourself, get rest. You know, we're here to be healthy. And we're like, yeah, of course we are. Right. Good point. So it, it's a lot of activity and a lot of work, but I do like there's some focus on, hey, take time for yourself. Mondays and Tuesdays, for example, we have a platform which anyone can post events on, but we're saying like, we're not posting anything Monday, Tuesday, make sure you have those days kind of for yourself or like catch up on work and things. And for biohackers, it's a mix of like uh, scientists and mad scientists, I would say. So for example, some of my housemates, they do surgeries where they put magnets into their fingers so that way they can have kind of like a sixth sense and detect magnetic fields and feel a tangle with them. And he, like my, one of my housemates, for example, if you turn on an electric toothbrush, he can kind of feel it, which is intriguing. And just like people who want to experiment and, and test uh, limits of things. So yeah, I'd say it's kind of like mad scientist hacker vibe. And we got like a, a biohacking lab as well. We're going to like try and get a 3D printer into that as and such. Um, yeah. So this one, it's not really like Burning Man vibe, but it's, I'd say it's a little closer to that more uh, pluripotent stem cell environment where things can arise out of this, these waters than maybe Zuzalu was because Zuzalu was just like packed with so much happening. Uh, whereas here, you know, we're trying to make space where people can organize things that maybe aren't planned out yet as well. And that's also a, a vision of mine personally, that we can make spaces where you say like, hey, people build it themselves and it should get easier and easier to create these things. Yeah. And, and people might be thinking like, wait, I thought this was like Web3 related. Like how are scientists here? Like that's one of the, the, the major kind of things that surprised me getting into the DSI space. Um, and so can you kind of like talk a little bit about like the work people are doing and how that intersects with web, web three, but like, I'm like, I was in some, uh, some DSI event in, in Taiwan and there was like a lot of people from there were heading, uh, to Vitalia. So yeah, I kind of, oh. kind of give like a little bit of overview of like, yeah, like there was like Athena Dao. I, I think people from Molecule yeah. were headed over there. Uh, but. Yeah, so like a lot of a lot of them, and I, I learned a lot of stuff where like they're actual scientists. Like I, I had never met you no know, like I actually yeah I don't I'm so in the Web three bubble where I hardly meet people who don't do Web three in my day to day. So to actually see more scientists come in this space and then build mechanisms to fund um, research that isn't even funded in the traditional um, like science and medicine space that was uh that was crazy inspiring so can you kind of talk about like what's inspiring you in terms of the work people are doing yeah for example my friend maria she's brazilian and uh, i can't remember the name of the platform but she's trying to make like a dci publishing platform where the publishers directly get the money themselves from tokenizing their works and they can set the prices because Right now, publishing in science is so screwed. Like the money does not go straight to the researchers. It goes to the publishers and you're kind of forced to hand it over to the publishers who can set the prices and make it really expensive when maybe you want this research to be out there and people to be able to access, but you kind of have to go through the publishers so people can find it. It's really bad. And so she's trying to fix that with this, for example, with tokenizing your works of, uh, of research and writing. I think that's brilliant. Uh, then there's kind of people doing like physical changes, like I mentioned that those biohackers, and then there's also people who are more on the interest of like, how do we create governance spaces where the FDA doesn't stop us from doing things like, so Lawrence, for example, yeah, he, I think he shared about this. It's okay. Like, or, or yeah. So there's family members who are with terminal illnesses right now, and there's things that we could try, like, we know they're going to die. And if we could try and do like experimental things that maybe have like the smallest chance of helping, but actually also as well as that, maybe someone who is dying says, I want to use my last time to do these things that maybe could advance science and save other people. And the fact that you're not allowed to do that usually is kind of crazy. Like you should be able to choose if I am dying and I have like a month left to live, I would be so pissed 
if I'm not free to choose like what I do with my own body with a month left, like that's so wild. Um, yeah, so that's like some of the motivation as well. People wanting to create governance zones where, for example, there's companies here in Prospera, which are able to innovate on drugs faster. Yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, and I, I think even especially like this is, this to me is a really big issue. And one of the re reasons I don't even stay in America because of pharma, because of food not being clean because of uh, a lot of different factors and, and players that be. And I think uh, one of the things a lot of us came into Web3 is to really tackle these big problems and these big players and actually be revolutionary. And I think that one of the most uh, you know unspoken heroes in the space are the people who are tackling big pharma. So I, I love to see from the research to, uh, to, like the, to the governance, uh, uh, it, it just everyone coming in, into the space uh, as well. And yeah, and, and looking at under, under research stuff like hair loss, women's health, and, and, and so much more. What would you um, kind of, kind of go, going off of like a little bit about on the startup city type of environment? Like what do you, what do you kind of see? And, and you mentioned this like uh, briefly in Montenegro is like, it's kind of an enclave of things where like mm. you kind of, there's a certain level of privilege you need to actually like go there. Um, there, there really isn't these pop-up cities happening in uh, Ukraine and Syria and other places you're going to as well. And even in Honduras, it's a little bit of like, a, a res I, I don't know, I mean, educate me, but like, how do we, what do you, do you envision kind of this blueprint going into kind of a non-resort type of style or like, how do we, how do we kind of build these pop-up cities that evolve into network states into regions that need it the most? Or like, what do you, what's, what's the blueprint for that? Yeah, great question. And that's been a, a challenge of mine and like wondering morally about the direction of the things I'm building, communities I'm in. And I would say, listen to the women in Northeast Syria. Uh, so when I was there recently after Zoo Connect, when we were together in, in Turkey, then I was immediately after in Syria in a region where they had been spending decades meeting secretly to try and plan out how do we make our own civil institutions and groups in what they call democratic confederalism. And a lot of them would get arrested by like Assad and, uh, and nationalists, whether Arab or Turks, nationalists and such. Uh, but the women's groups were able to hide a little better, maybe in part because the people in power didn't believe that women could understand politics anyways. And they, they underestimated these groups who kept meeting for years. And so when 2012 came around and there was the Arab Spring and so much movement of people demanding democracy, there were some violent uprisings with toppled dictators, but then kind of just had more of the same bad problems and same new people in power doing this, right? Whereas in this area, they said, we're going to do our own parallel system. And instead of like trying to kill the dictator and like maybe get another bad one, we just start a community that people can opt into and we organize into local communes where you're with your neighbors and you make group decisions and you have a representative from your local communes and those representatives meet together. So maybe there's like 20 communes, you have representatives together, right? And it's just like a room of 20 people together talking and they do a lot of consensus uh, meetings. And then you go up to the third level and now you're representing like 20 groups of 20, right? And you go up to four levels and you're representing a massive amount, but even at the higher levels in theory, you can have kind of the same sort of meeting space. Uh, so that's what I was trying to learn about while I was there. And they have now about 5 million people in what's called the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria. It's also known colloquially as Rojava. And their values, their literal like spoken value is decentralization. It's women's rights, uh, well, rights for everyone and like all having diversity and having uh, representation of all ethnicities and religions. And it's so different from what's happening in so many neighboring areas. Uh, they're also famous because they had women and men soldiers who fought against ISIS and they won without having a central government. They were actually very successful in organizing and doing this. And it's one of the most amazing examples, I think, that human history has ever seen of local groups cross-coordinating to make a bigger society. And that was really encouraging. And I, that's what I'm trying to see with pop-up cities, for example. I think in fall, there's some people interested and we'll see if we can announce it if we plan it out a little bit more. Uh, for coming back to Chiang Mai and having multiple of these pop-up cities be neighbors at the same time and maybe have people cross-coordinate and meet between them. 
And how can we scale it up? Maybe do more long-term things. So yeah, I would say Syria, the people there are really impressive. I would look into Rojava and their system and learn about that more. And uh, I'm actually going to invite one of them as a speaker for the conference I'm doing. So that's my dream is I kind of connect people who are like in civil rights, indigenous rights movements, and tech people, people who are really good at social tech, I would say, but don't really have the digital tech. People are really good at digital tech and are interested in social tech, meet those two together, like confederations of nations in the Amazon jungle, or these groups in Syria and connect them with us Web3 people and these biotech people and people interested in making new special economic zones. And we can learn from those who have been fighting for sovereignty in different ways for many years that we can learn from. Now that's that's incredible. Like often, and I was asking you, like, how do we do the Zalu? Like, where where is the playbook? Like, how? And and I I think that type of perspective of like looking at existing communities, bridging what's being done, and having that intersection uh, is is a, is a way better approach than trying to kind of re- repeat uh, what's being done. And I'm like, I mean, wh- what are so like like what's actually on your radar in terms of like these communities? Like like Ukraine, you went to Syria. Like, how do you? How do you hear about like where these societies are going on and like what's how do you even go like <laughs> to be honest but like what's what's kind of that like what's what's on your radar in terms of like societies or or, or things you want to learn about or you haven't checked out yet yeah for structuring that there's a book i read called tribe by sebastian junger and that was when I was like really searching like, Hey, what's a new religion? What's the meaning of life I can find, especially when I was backpacking around when I was 17 and such. And it goes into a few different examples. One, it goes into an example where people who uh, went to war who are from America uh, have really high PTSD rates, whether or not they saw conflict. And then people in Israel for soldiers, when they come back from somewhere have really low PTSD rates. Right. And so the the correlation actually was way stronger, not between how bad the conflict was and the trauma, but were you going back to a community of people who you felt like could understand what you've been through and you could feel connected with them? So the Israeli soldiers, for example, they went back to a community where there's just like everyone's done military service and they can relate to them. And so that social connection was really important. And pretty much the the argument in the book is we are designed biologically and, and mentally to be living in tribes. That's how we evolved for many more thousands of years than we've had agriculture in cities and beyond. And there's a dissonance between how we are designed to live and how we live now. And pretty much we need a tribe and we need community. And that's what makes us feel safe and helps with so many mental issues. And so it goes into examples of people who've been through war, goes into examples of veterans, it goes into examples of indigenous communities and like in jungles and such. And it goes into examples of people who've been to disaster zones where, for example, like people who had different economic classes and different size houses, they kind of lose everything and they're all leveled out and they just look around and have to take care of one another and changes that happen during that. So I've spent time with the Marine Corps and so there's that. I've spent time in war zones and uh, spent time with indigenous communities. And the fourth one I'd say that I have not done is like where there's been, for example, earthquakes, natural disasters, and see, like, can I go and help out and also go understand a little bit more of the experience? So I'd say that's one that's remaining on my radar. And then also, uh, when I heard about Rojava in Syria, for example, that was during the coordinations week at Zuzalu, and it sounded too incredible to be true. And so pretty much as soon as I possibly could on my schedule, I went to there. It took a lot of communication. We had to get, like, special permission and some various things. But yeah, if you if you really care about it and you ask people about it, there's ways. No, that's absolutely um, incredible. And so, I mean, we're coming. I don't know how much more time you have, but we're we're coming up uh, to the to the hour. And you mentioned kind of a lot of things to get involved. So you you mentioned Via Prize, open source. I know you have a lot of contributors there. People can get involved in that front. You mentioned mm-hmm. the startup cities. Uh, you mentioned kind of different network states um, and, and things like that. So like, what, what's, how, how can people, like, what are you looking for in terms of contributors? And then like, how can, yeah, how can people get involved? Thanks for asking. Yeah, I would say you can find Via Prize on Twitter and uh, there should be a link. Well, actually, if you go to the website, viaprize.org, then there's also a link to our Telegram. So you could message in, in there and connect with us directly and we're happy to chat. 
Uh, if you want to look at the code, it's on GitHub and that's open source. If you want to contribute to campaigns, now we just transitioned over to a new website, so there's not as many campaigns on there and uh, now populating it more. But for example, that community in Chiang Mai where there's a kid's shelter where we visited with the Moo team, and I love the Moo Chiang Mai community, uh, we're supporting them. They need help with repairing some water tanks where there's leaking there, for example. Really inspiring story of like Dang, who started this orphanage just like around a year ago. Well, it's not technically like an orphanage. It's like a, like a kid's shelter. Um, love that group so you can support them. I'm about to launch a crowdfunding campaign for Francisco as soon as we figure out how we can turn crypto into cash in Ecuador. Uh, and yeah, I'm also thinking I'll make an online discussion forum for people interested in network states and coordinations, things like that. I think I'd call it the Network Society Forum. So hopefully it should be a place for people to add some long form writing and collaborate in that way. So I'm gonna work with people here, putting that together. So yeah, I would say, feel free to reach out if you're interested in these things and thanks for asking. Yeah, and I'll definitely put all of those in the show notes and really appreciate kind of people writing and all these minds coming together from all these events. I, I, I meet people, not only do I learn things that change my life, but also as a builder, change my product roadmap, changes like saves a lot of time. Um, there. And so shout out to all the great community organize, organizers out there like you, Noah, and the builders. Um, definitely check up Startup Cities. Hopefully I can get this out right before then to give people time uh, to, to come out there. And yeah, it was it was amazing catching up with you again, seeing you in like five different, at least in the past half year, like five different cities <laughs> around the world. And yeah, excited to, to catch up with you uh, again, probably in uh, the next couple of months. So yeah, thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, and I think you're a great host. I was honored to be here and really happy chatting with you. All right, see you. Goodbye. All right, let's, uh, we got, we got.